Good afternoon and welcome to Africa's Vision Network. Africa's Vision Network features cult African cultural awareness, spirituality, religion, education, economic empowerment, and other issues focusing on the African world. I'm Robin Robin, your host. Our program today will focus on the um, life and contributions of the late mathematician, Dr. Abdul Alim Abdullah Shabazz. Dr. Shabazz was uh, responsible for training over 50% of the black mathematicians who hold doctorates today in the USA. Uh, first, we will hear a few words from Dr. Shabazz himself. However, in order for you to understand where I'm coming from, I need to let you know a little bit about uh, my uh, personal background. I grew up in a small town in Bessemer, Alabama, uh, in what one can describe as an African village. Some of you may realize that uh, Bessemer, Alabama, in those days uh, had a population of more than 70% African American. And uh, all of my teachers were Africans. Uh, my whole community was African. My mother and father were Africans. And uh, we grew up uh, in a loving and a very nurturing environment uh, where we learned uh, to respect our fathers, our fathers, in fact, all of the adults uh, in the community. Uh, we reference uh, these uh, teachers uh, of ours, the preachers were reverenced uh, in the community. Uh, the teachers were nothing more than extensions of our family. They were uh, like our mothers and our fathers, our, our grandmothers and our grandfathers, or our, or our older brothers or our older sisters. There was much love and compassion uh, shown to us as children, as young people growing up in a community uh, uh, hounded on all sides by all kinds of persecution, but we had great hope. My mother only went to the seventh grade. My father was totally illiterate. In fact, I taught him how to sign his name uh, as I grew into uh, knowledge and uh, into uh, a certain amount of experience in this world. However, my mother and father were not dumb people. They were brilliant people. They had the foresight and the uh, insight uh, to inspire us with a desire to scale the heights and to go as far as we could go with our abilities so long as we worked hard and kept ourselves uh, uh, in a right state of mind, uh, in uh, clean uh, morals, and in uh, the aspirations for the good uh, in this society. With us this afternoon to discuss the memories and contributions of Dr. Shabazz are Dr. Genevieve Knight and Dr. William Hawkins. Dr. Genevieve Knight is a retired professor from Coppin State University, and Dr. Hawkins is a re semi-retired professor from the University of the, of the District of Columbia. He is also the present director of Strengthening Underrepresented Minority Mathematics Achievement, the SUMA program at the Mathematics Association of America. Welcome to Africa's Vision Network. Please tell our audience something about yourselves. Dr. Knight, if you would go first. I'm Genevieve Knight. I'm from Brunswick, Georgia. I grew up at the cusp of the civil rights movement. And to us, education was everything. I knew of and about Dr. Lonnie Cross but long before he met me and I met him. It was one of the legends that if you were a minority in the South and you wanted to continue your education in mathematics, you had to go to Atlanta University. Georgia had a state law. No black person could ever enroll in any university system on the graduate level in the state of Georgia. So um, what Dr. Shabazz did was to send out his students to, to find students who were prepared 
And then over a period of two years, because he believed that if you're worried about where's my next meals coming from, I don't have any place to stay. I'm not able to pay my two issues and so forth. You can't be a scholar, there's no way. Because you can't do it 24 hours a day. So what he did, he made sure that his students mm -hmm. would identify students. And that's how I got identified. Um, and my junior year in my undergraduate program, I had a professor who taught me calculus who was a student of Dr. Shabazz, and, he's, and he told me, he said, you know, young lady, you're the type of person that Shabazz, he was lying across then, but I would say Shabazz, so you know the gentleman we are talking about. And he told, he told me, keep the average up, and he'll do the paperwork. So it was at least, at least two years, I never met the gentleman, Dr. Shabazz, but he knew about me, and he uh, he knew about me, and I knew about him. But we never met each other. But that's how I got to I got to know um, Dr. Shabazz. I didn't go to school to be in mathematics. I was going to be a commercial dietitian. And when the call came out to try to recruit people. This is a very, very important point that young folks today ought to realize. We're going to recruit young people already in college who have the kind of background we need. Mm -hmm. And so they sent for us. And I went to the interview. And uh, you had to look on the list. You could either be in science or mathematics. I selected mathematics because you didn't have many labs to do. <laughs> and so they said, well, well, as long as you can make the, uh, make the uh, uh, program work for you, we can have that. And from that point on in my life, getting into Atlanta University, leaving Atlanta University, getting to a summer program for teaching at University of Georgia, and on and on and on, Dr. Shabazz was there. And when they said that um, you're not qualified, I said, you please call my advisor from Atlanta University, Dr. Uh, Lonnie Cross, then. And so that's a little bit about me, and I'm not going to say a whole lot because it's about um, uh, the man uh, himself. But uh, like I said, I graduated from a high school. I had physics. I had chemistry. I had four years of language. I had two years of French, and I could write. Okay. And as those of you who know uh, Dr. Shabazz, you know he's very well read. He can talk about cultures of all around the world. He knows people, and uh, he wrote well. He was a great communicator. And above all, when he's talked to you, because you heard a few minutes ago his voice, very distinct. Uh, the grammar was correct. His diction was correct. So that this is the kind of thing that shaped folks like me who wanted to go. But without somebody like Dr. Shabazz, never would have made it. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hawkins, could you tell us how you were acquainted with Dr. Shabazz? Okay. I um, <clears throat> had uh, gone to graduate school at the University of uh, Michigan and returned to D.C. to go back and teach at uh, Cadoza High School. And when I went to the school board to say, well, I've got a master's in math from uh, University of Michigan. I have a master's in physics from Howard. Uh, I, you know, I want to go back to teach. Well, we don't need any math teachers. So I was a bit of a loss. Ran into a classmate of mine who said, well, our old teacher is um, chair of the math department at Federal City College. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I started there in 1970. And Dr. Shabazz was invited by a faculty member to give a talk in 1974. And so that was my first meeting with him, I think, because of uh, his involvement in the Nation of Islam. Uh, 
I knew of him because this was something that was in the news a lot back in the early 70s. And so I probably heard of him, had some awareness of him. But in any case, he came to speak. And he talked about the Aishango bone that had been, it was an article in Scientific American. And he talked about the African origins of humanity and a number of other topics. And this was my first introduction to him. And so, um, and you know, it was, I, re I retained a lifelong awareness of him uh, because of the different things he was involved in that were involved in mathematics. I certainly uh, remained aware of his, you know, achievements. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Um, I understand you spoke about Dr. Shabazz having a protocol, and part of it I hear was his students going out and recruiting, you know, locating these other students who were prepared to uh, go through these PhD programs. Dr. Knight, could you explain some other facets of the, the protocol? I don't think anybody has ever called it uh, Shabazz Protocol. That is mm -hmm. something uh, that I, I, I always say, well, it's, it's just a protocol. It's the way that he conducted himself and how mm -hmm. he recruited people. And guess what? All his efforts were done in a manner that you had positive results. Mm -hmm. So I like to say that the Shabazz Protocol, and I plan to write an article about this, uh, is, a, is a set of expectations that he believed generated positive results in a consistent manner. When I do these things in this order, I can produce a student who can go to the next level and will be very successful. And it's a series of, I guess, a, a series uh, of pathways of academic, in school kinds of things Mm -hmm. uh, from PK through 20 and beyond, aligned with the life experiences from birth to death, uh, with a focus on the teacher and the student engaging in some interaction, and also means to pay for the cause Okay. of a journey, a uh, dream. Now, a lot of African Americans today cannot afford education because of the cost, and it's going to be even worse uh, in the next couple of years. But there is a way that we can prepare the students, your church, your community, your fraternity, your sorority, to do it. Now, Dr. Shabazz didn't believe in remedial education by the definition. Lots and lots of, of African-American students went to college and they had to take something called remediation. All it was was a uh, whole number based arithmetic. He says, if, if you can remediate something, it means you already done it and it wasn't done correctly. So you got to fix it. But wait a minute now. Where are the ideas from geometry, from topology, applications, and all these things about critical thinking, uh, telling people versus what's doing? Now, Dr. Shabazz got in uh, a little hot water with some of the institutions that he worked during his professional career at Clark Atlanta University and also Lincoln University. He says, you waste enough your time and money if you're going to teach people something that they can't use at the next level. Mm -hmm. It's the expectations of what it is. And also, one must know one's history mm -hmm. to see that people of color are very creative, loving people, and if you look at the history of um, mathematics across the nation and across the world, you will see that it was the person of color from the continent of Africa that made a difference. And he stressed 
a non-Western uh, civilization. Now, the kinds of things you can tell people things, but you must live it. If a person doesn't have money to go to school, you got to find a way of giving it. Mm -hmm. So he lived it, and he lived it through his instruction. What he taught in his classes, mm -hmm. and what did he do with his gatherings? Now, some of us are old enough to know about gatherings. If you look at the news now, lots of communities, lots of foundations are talking about the gatherings where men mentor young boys, where we, we're not afraid to look at our big noses and, you know, and our large feet and so forth, but we could dance. We could strut. And all these things came from us, and we can, and we can do that. So to me, the protocol is that set of expectations that if you do these things in a manner, consistent manner over the years, it won't happen in six years, won't happen in a dozen years, but it would be a time to do it. So that was my interpretation of uh, what I mean by the protocol. Now, some of you were present at the memorial service. Mm -hmm. and there were three ex-students of Shabazz, and they said the same thing that, uh, uh, and without getting together and said, we're going to talk about that. It must be something there. And I said, it's a protocol. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hawkins, since you were not a, a mentee of Dr. Shabazz, <laughs> but you were familiar with his work. Have you had the um, opportunity to use his, you know, protocols in your teaching? Uh, I don't know that I, let's say, consciously did so. Mm -hmm. Certainly thinking that the students' capabilities perhaps uh, weren't all, uh, you know, it's not a question of their background so much as what their goals might be and what they might be willing to work hard to achieve, I would say that was an influence because he, as Dr. Knight said, uh, was very adamant about um, the, I guess, the uh, not not believing in remedial education. He was a very, very strong person uh, against that. And um, he, he and I talked on occasion because I would see him at the professional meetings, and one of the things he talked about was uh, at the time of the merger of Clark College and Atlanta University mm -hmm. to form Clark Atlanta University, he described, uh, I think, a very small number of math majors uh, in, in the program. Uh, and then after the merger and his time there, they were graduating significant, very significant numbers of students with uh, very significant numbers of math majors. And uh, this is something that not, not always the case. If you look around the country, lots of programs have just a few majors. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was very successful in getting large numbers of students to complete the undergraduate degree and then, and then go on to graduate school. And this is entirely separate from his early time mm -hmm. at, at Atlanta University, which was when Dr. Knight was there. But this is in you know uh, more recent times. And then okay. he... Um, after he left um, uh, Clark Atlanta University, then he went to Grambling. Uh, they went to Lincoln, I guess. Lincoln. And he was there for a while. Then he went to uh, Grambling State University. And at all these institutions, he was very influential in increasing the number of math majors, you know, at the undergraduate level. Okay. And encouraging students to go on. And uh, he was a really a relentless promoter of student capabilities that uh, you could uh, you could accomplish perhaps way more than you thought you uh, could if you applied yourself. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, once again, I was, I was um, you know, he and I passed in, in a certain sense with, uh, without him. I was never a direct student of his. Yeah. But I think we recognize in the math community, certainly among minority mathematicians, that he was a very big influence. Okay. And Dr. Knight, you said that and you also, Dr. Hawkins, said Dr. Shabazz did not believe in remediation and that uh, he didn't believe in teaching students things that they really couldn't use. Yes, Could sir. you explain what some of those things might oh, be? Oh, yes. Uh, he believed 
that if students could think, can speak well, and can work together in groups that they could learn, it's no sense in bringing somebody at a uni to the university and teach them things they should have learned in second grade. Where was it going? Mm -hmm. If you passed that course, you had to go to a college algebra course. But what, what about all those things in between? He wasn't so much against helping people. Some people say, he doesn't want to help people. Everybody can't be smart. That's not what he said. He said, if you're going to bring people to the institutions, Teach them what they have to know in order to move up. Mm -hmm. Who wants to be at an institution eight years and don't get a, uh, you know, and you don't get a, 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 a degree? So that's what he meant about it. Mm -hmm. Don't have our African American students using slang and all this other stuff. He spoke well. He spoke several languages. He could think and he could write. And if you're going to do a proof, for instance, in mm -hmm. graduate school, you got to communicate and you got to know what those kinds of things that will move you to the next level. Now, he, you know, sometimes people uh, misinterpret a statement, but what he, what he was saying, get them prepared, but make sure they start getting prepared in the homes. Okay. That kind of thing, but it was not. And then it was a shame that some uh, historically black institution would bring herds and herds of people and they never graduated. Mm -hmm. And then when the student loans came about, it got these people in the debt mm -hmm. and they would never be able to repay. And they still don't have any kind of degree. But it was, a, what it was it, a cow, a cash cow to get money to the institutions that they did something else with and it didn't help the students. Uh, so does that mean that the students didn't have like a skill set to kind of successfully? Yeah, you're having people trying to write a proof who couldn't write a sentence. Okay. okay. That kind of thing. And they didn't realize that you got preposition of phrases mm -hmm. and that, that comma meant something. Mm -hmm. John Smith is seven feet, two inches tall, comma, mm -hmm. but he does not play basketball. <laughs> that okay. kind of thing you have to do in problem solving okay. and so forth. The yeah. first part is a true statement, mm -hmm. but the second part said, well, all that's true. However, you can draw the conclusion he must be a basketball player. Okay, mm -hmm. okay so I see that um, with mathematics, uh, reading was a large part of his Reading program. and writing. Mm -hmm. and. On television today, there are people running around talking about what happened to the arts. I don't know anybody who is an excellent mathematician who does not appreciate art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, just seeing patterns, look at your dress and, you know, all these patterns and so forth, they have meanings. And long before, what was his name, William Thurston started saying, make these patterns. People said, man's crazy. Mm -hmm. But he said by seeing patterns. It generates something within me that I can see how to do this proof. Mm -hmm. Now people are getting to see, ha, huh, if you are good in science and mathematics, you're good in art. Now you just can mm -hmm. interview mm -hmm. anybody you want to interview. They mm -hmm. would tell you the beauty of cell division mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. these crystallized things mm -hmm. and, and things of that type. So it's so what, um, uh, what Shabazz tried to do if I get a group of students to come in and they already can read and write and get the basic kinds of things, mm -hmm. then I can shape my class instruction. I can shape their environment in such a way that we can accelerate things. And I got to be there for you. You get to the next level, you don't have the money, or you're not quite ready, come back to summer school, I'll send you somewhere. One thing he did was to make sure he sent you somewhere that you can get the right teachers and you could graduate. He did that. I'll give you an example. Uh, he knew that in the program at Atlanta University, there was a, a whole segment that not many of us had the opportunity, know how bright we were, to learn. That was complex analysis. So he brings up his 
colleague from the University of Michigan, Alan Shields, mm -hmm. who came to talk to us. We had projects, got to work in groups, and this is group project, now this is your individual project, Hawkins and so forth, and we didn't have emails. He would, he would send us handwritten notes. You're working on your project. You got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do that. So when it was time for us to move to the next level, mm -hmm. to get a PhD, you knew a little bit about analysis. And these people came down on their own. And other ones came a part of the NSF, uh, National Science Foundation, to make sure. He made sure that you cannot leave here and say you're going to get a PhD now. You don't know about complex analysis. You don't know how to do a proof. You don't know how to argue certain things. He was one voice. But he would bring all his colleagues in, and he made the government pay for it. That's another thing we better learn how to do. Make the president, Obama, whoever it is, pay for the education for our children. But you got to be there mm -hmm. to support them. You don't have to be a PhD mathematician. You can support them. You have sons and daughters and, and, and grandchildren. Support them. Okay, um, Dr. Hawkins, mm -hmm. I, um, as the director of SUMA, I see that uh, African Americans and other minor so-called minorities are still underrepresented in the fields of mathematics. Um, so what kinds of things does your organization do that might be aligned with some of the um, teachings that Dr. Shabazz had right. to increase the number? <clears throat> well, one of the things that the um, association uh, was involved in, and still is, is undergraduate research. And this is something that uh, for a long time mathematicians thought that undergraduates could not do significant research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in the sciences, you know, a chemistry lab, biology lab, physics mm -hmm. lab, uh, there were many situations where undergraduates were involved in research, even at research institutions. You know, a person would have uh, undergraduate students in their lab. And so it's become much more popular in recent years to involve undergraduates in research. And so the association uh, has worked to increase minority representation in that arena by uh, funding projects that focused on minority students. Mm -hmm. So the faculty member may or may not be at a minority institution, may or may not be a minority mathematician, but the students were underrepresented minority students. Mm -hmm. And so We've uh, actually started this program in 2003, and there have been four young students, because uh, hundreds of students have gone through, but four of them as to date have earned PhDs. Uh, there were, uh, interestingly enough, there were two students, uh, two female students, uh, one Hispanic, one African American, from the fir very first uh, year who went on to earn PhDs. Uh, there is a uh, young man from the, uh, so that was 2003. Uh, in fact, there was a third young, there was a third uh, individual. So there's two young ladies from one program, one young man from another program. All three of them have PhDs. And a fourth student from two years later in 2005 who has gone on to earn his PhD. And other students, uh, because it takes a long time, these are undergraduate students. So you figure that they have several years of undergraduate school to complete then they have to go to graduate school and, and, and what have you. So all that's a rather lengthy process. So it's not something that you're going to have the results in, in the short term, but we do have some very good long-term results. And um, one of the other things that we're interested in trying to do is to expand the competitions that are currently um, held uh, in mathematics and there's a series of competitions, the American, it's called the AMC American Math Competitions, 8, 10, and 12. Mm -hmm. And the number of minority students participating is rather low. So we're looking to uh, see if there might be ways to increase minority uh, participation in that particular activity. So those are a couple of things. That's something a little newer, but the undergraduate research is something that's been ongoing really since 03, 2003. Mm -hmm. And really, um, and I, have, I haven't looked at latest statistics, but let's say around 400 students had gone through the programs. Mm -hmm. And the programs tend to be very small, about four, four students uh, at a given site. So it's been lots and lots of sites 
and a lot of students have gone through and a number of them have earned PhDs. Okay, and um, Dr. Knight, in your opinion, what are the major obstacles facing African American students uh, in present day? Uh, or maybe, for example, how do you think or how did you know Dr. Shabazz felt about calculators in classrooms? Uh, you know, like the advent of that. And, you know, children not even knowing things like times tables or math mm -hmm. facts and, mm -hmm. and whether they can actually progress through math courses without having that kind of base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you remember now, Dr. Shivaz believed that people start learning at birth and you have to be in the environment. Now, things like um, a child can identify likeness and similarities and so forth. Now, you're not going to talk about, say, in topology to somebody who's five years old, but they know is the difference between this figure that has a piece in it. You take a rubber band and you can scratch it any way you want to scratch it. Mm -hmm. You hit the same amount of the rubber band, but every time you move it, you're going to, if you move it too much, it'll pop. It's no longer the original kind of thing. But Shabazz really uh, believed in progress mm -hmm. and chemistry and all these other kinds of things. He was a component, because I know every summer he would go uh, work with NASA and places like that up at, uh, in the Washington area, because he sometimes stayed in College Park, where he worked with groups of students. And he was a component of international kinds of activities uh, with the non-Western culture. You can't have people designing uh, handheld calculators, these iPods, and all these things they're doing. They gotta know mathematics. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he Stress, and I heard him alluding it to his introductory remarks. You got to have mentors. You got to have what we call apprenticeship. You got to have that man that my grandfather uh, never went to school. He grew up on a, on a rice plantation on an island, and he mm -hmm. learned how to write his name as an adult when he married my grandmother. Okay. So, but he did the most beautiful artwork. Mm -hmm. You know, with the iron, the uh, foundry and so forth, we have to capture these kinds of things. It makes a difference. You have to see. He said, if you don't see what's behind this word, you will never do. It is not what you look at; it's what you see. And long before they had calculators, Shabazz used to tell us in class, "You got to see these things. You got to teach people how to do these things." Not only did he tell you, he showed you how. And it was one lesson, he opened up a lot of people's eyes in his class. He said, do you know how to interpret and the meaning of the fundamental uh, uh, definition of uh, a limit? The mm -hmm. formal definition of a limit. He told you word for word what it is. So when you take a calculus, you have an application problem. You know what these things mean. Why does it, why does it uh, have to be zero? Why won't it never be zero? He said, these little symbols down here tell you that. And those mm -hmm. are the kinds of things. I, I don't think he was anti-calculators. I really don't. But he was anti-giving somebody a calculator who couldn't count or who, who didn't know the multiplication facts. There are ways mm -hmm. to know. I know what 8 times 9 is. So that's a way for me to tell you what uh, eight times tens ought to be, and, and things like that. I don't think he was anti, but I, like I don't think he was anti uh, uh, remedial mathematics. He was saying if you're going to bring people up, they can do it. Don't tell people they can do anything they want to be and put a period that that is not true. Mm -hmm. That is not true. You got to have this dream. You got to have a vision. You got to take me by my hand and say, if you want to be an engineer, you want to be a producer. You know, these are the things that you got to do. And let me tell you how you get there. I know so-and-so who has a company. And mm -hmm. you could go in the summertime. You can do that. But you got to work real hard. And you can't know more than the supervisor. 
I know mm -hmm. lots of students who were brilliant students. Mm -hmm. They couldn't make it in the workforce. They knew more than the supervisor, and they had to let them go. Mm -hmm. But that is, that's why I said this protocol is what he said. If you do these things, you will make it and be very successful. Um, Dr. Hawkins, what about your, your views on things like uh, technology? Okay. Um, I was just thinking as Dr. Knight was talking, I think the, I don't think there's a problem with the technology. It cannot substitute for, you might say, the confidence that you have if you can work something out yourself. Um, and you know, over, over teaching many, many years, um, you would see students, let's say, have the technology. Mm -hmm. But because they don't have the underlying skills, they don't have the confidence to apply the technology effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is whether it's a graphing calculator. I remember teaching a class and the students' algebra seemed to be very, very weak. Mm -hmm. So even though you had a really good calculator, he couldn't make it, he couldn't put it through its you know tr uh, paces you might say mm -hmm. because he, since he couldn't work the problem himself and he mm -hmm. couldn't really master the calculator effectively to make the calculator and help him do the problem mm -hmm. and uh, I was um, you know I sit up and watch kids now with let's say an electronic textbook mm -hmm. now in the old days when you brought this huge this huge calculus book to class if you opened the book and sat there and just followed the lecture in the book and don't take any notes, you probably weren't going to get much out of it. And the fact that it's an electronic textbook doesn't change that. I <laughs> see the students, you know, <laughs> running their fingers, you know, changing the pages and so on and so forth, but they're not writing anything down. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so the problem is they're not engaging them, you know, they're trying to let the electronic book or, or the technology substitute for their own active engagement with the material. And until you do it, do something with it yourself, you're not going to be able to utilize it. So, you know, the fact that it's in the book electronically doesn't make you any better off than having this 100-pound book that you're carrying around or $200 book. I mean, there's no difference. If you don't open it, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to get anything out of it. And it doesn't matter how big it is or how, how electronically sophisticated it is. And I think the students... Uh, often you find students got the, the best technology, but they're not, they're not really doing anything with it other than just sort of bringing it. And mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. in any case, I, I had the feeling that maybe my time had come as a teacher. <laughs> I'd, I'd best let the students be the students and I'd just go on my, my merry way. And uh, since they, they didn't want to accommodate me, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I would just you know, fade on into the <laughs> sunset, uh, and let it go at that. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's sad for someone to have this expensive technology and not really get any significant use out of it. And you have to do something with the material yourself. You know, uh, I used to give homework, don't, don't want to drag it on. But, uh, and I felt the homework was beneficial, not to me. I didn't get any great benefits out of grading the homework for hours at night, but I thought it would benefit the students. And some students learned well under that, you know, circumstance, and others refused. So, refused you know, so. attempt. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right, so. I've had yeah. that experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Knight, could you um, tell us what you, what, uh, why did Dr. Uh, Shabazz feel it was so important for African Americans to pursue PhDs in mathematics? Well, he said, look, if you check history correctly, we are the people who were very intelligent. We invented some of these things. They got evidence, and nobody's ever been able to disprove it, that the cradle of civilization in mathematics came out of Africa. Now, Shabazz had his favorite lecture. It was about, um, uh, <laughs> about Africa. Mm -hmm. At mathematics at the dawn, and he would tell you about all these things, and he was, very, you know, how he was very energetic. He pronounced the words right, and he could show you what things meant. And I have sat in the back of the room and watched adults and young people's faces. It's like a flower, a bud opening up. You mean to tell me that black folks did that? 
And that's where it, 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 you know, it really, really was. He felt that if he knew how to articulate and if he knew how to see things like everybody else, the Germans, uh, the French, and all these other people had enough sense to steal all the ideas. That's what they did, stole the ideas from the black. They're still doing it today. They stole the ideas <laughs> and put it in and said, it's theirs. But Shabazz always could tell you. See, that's another thing. People want to disagree with history. Shabazz would, and he would stand up just like that and give you a half hour of a lecture, and mm -hmm. everything would be uh, 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 correct. But it's, we often ask him, why don't you write this book, Mathematics at the Dawn? Perhaps some of his students who really want to make a contribution ought to take his notes and text things, because this textbook we used when we were uh, in his class, it was published in 1953. This was Lectures in Analytic and Projective Geometry. Mm -hmm. He was a student, and, and, and uh, his uh, professor says that, that Mr. L. Cross, he was Lonnie Cross then, was a student, and we met this gentleman and, uh, and we use this book, because you can see my name in Bumstead Hall, Atlanta University. So this book we use in its analytic and uh, projected geometry. Now, little things he used to say, watch things like OF, mm -hmm. IN, mm -hmm. you know, oh, things words. like that. <laughs> yeah. These are prepositions, but they are powerful in mathematics. So if you can't read, and you can't interpret it, and you can't, you can't do it. But Shabazz believed in gatherings. And most of us who are old in this room know what that means. We used to have it at churches. He told us, and no black person could attend certain meetings. And if, if you're going to be a professional mathematician, you've got to belong to the associations. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, we're going to have this uh, club. Mm -hmm. And you will belong to this club. You're going to get a grade for this club. You can get an A, but you never get an A in this club unless you knew some mathematics and you belong to the organization. We couldn't go to the conventions, not in the South, because no black person could go to a hotel or sleep in a hotel during uh, a period. So what he did, he had a mock convention. He put all of the activities, all the name lectures in a hat and shook it up. And we went around the table and you pull. I pulled the Gibbs lecture. I gave the Gibbs lecture from Dr. Shabazz's notes, what he knew about it, from what his friends knew about it. Mm -hmm. Even before I put my foot into uh, a convention. So he said, you know, you be ready. When that call comes, you're going to be ready because I'm going to tell you this is what has to be done. And you didn't, I don't know about the rest of the folks. I know in my case, I didn't have to worry about money because mm -hmm. I didn't have money. I said, uh, Dr. Cross, I needed so-and-so. He said, okay, we'll take care of that. Got me a job at Hampton Inst. I would have never gotten a job at Hampton Institute. <laughs> I was an unknown. Okay. But, you know, that, that kind of thing. But this gatherings, and he believed in community. They used to have these time, town hall meetings down in Sage Hall. Benjamin Mays and uh, Dr. Mm. McBay and all those people, and Dr. Dennis, they would come, elegant people who could speak three or four languages, come and talk. And this was all before the so-called marches and all those things in the Civil Rights Movement. These are elegant people who could come and speak. But I never forgot one thing, the rest of us. We have too many people who know some mathematics. They are telling students, don't teach, and don't involve yourself with those people talking about black people. You mm -hmm. got your, you wouldn't be where you are today with your PhD in mathematics. Somebody didn't help you. Why don't you pass the baton and make reality for the other people? Yeah. So I, I just think he did a good thing. But I tell you one thing, if you go down the road of people who continue, they did something. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who serve on commissions. And those are the people who stood up and said that you will do this. Now, some of the females realized long before some of the other uh, males and so forth, 
if you talk about females, mm -hmm. there are more females than there are uh, different subgroups of females. Because if you say females, everybody who has a powerful husband, a powerful father, a powerful grandfather who has something in this country going to represent its, uh, uh, you know, the daughter or the granddaughter. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of things that we enjoy today, the females got them. Sorry, men have to hear that. <laughs> But the women got it, and they worked real hard. Okay. Yes. Okay. Through their connections with uh, these males in their lives. That's right. And then it's another story about in March they have a uh, uh, history month mm -hmm. uh, for women. Yeah. And you'd be surprised. A lot of these things that men claim they didn't do that. <laughs> Okay. The women did it, but they couldn't get published, so they had to use their brother's names, their husband's names, or the father's name if they had enough money to pay somebody. And they got a suspicion that it wasn't Einstein by himself. Oh. The brains behind <laughs> Einstein was his wife. Wow, that's the first time I've heard that. <laughs> oh, it's history. You ought to do a feature mm -hmm. on uh, in March on what women, 4,000 years of women mm -hmm. in science and mathematics. We'll definitely have to look into that. You look into that. It's only that, that's a whole thing on the internet. Four thousand years. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, uh, Dr. Hawkins, mm -hmm. do you have any comments about the? Well, <clears throat> like I said, I first um, became aware of Dr. Shabazz in 1974 at the time of this lecture. And uh, he talked about the Aishango bone, which had been discovered mm -hmm. in 19, I'm trying to think, uh, I think it was 1957, and by a Belgian mathematician in the Aishango region of Central Africa. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and my interest, uh, I guess you might say, was peaked. I, I copied the article, you know. In those days, everything was on uh, microfilm. You know, you see, you had to oh, kind of yeah. go out your way to get a copy of it, not like it is now. And, uh, well, you know, got a copy of the article. Um, and so when I went off to, um, uh, went back to graduate school, I encouraged the uh, black students to name themselves the Ishango Society of Mathematics. And uh, so rather than say the Black, Black Math mm -hmm. Students Association, you know, so on and so forth, try to have some uh, awareness of the history. And interestingly enough, so this one bone was discovered in 57. Fifty years later, uh, it came out that a second bone <laughs> was discovered by Jean de Heinzelman. And there was a conference which I was able to attend in Belgium. Belgium and... Um, I, I uh, promised Dr. Shabazz, and of course, you know, many, many people in academia are very dilatory in terms of following up on things, and I was <laughs> way worse than most, but I promised him a copy of this article, which was in French, so I, I really didn't know the translation, but it had been written in a, in a scientific journal, or in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a magazine at least, in, um, uh, in Europe. And I had a copy of it, so I had promised him. And so one time my phone auto-dialed him. And I said, uh, and he answered, I said, oh, Dr. Shabazz, I, di I didn't actually intend to call you, but since I did, I'm going to promise you to send you this article. So I made a copy of the article and sent it to him shortly thereafter. And uh, so, of course, and this was years after I had been at the conference and years after I had told him about it. And, of course, he could read the French and I couldn't. But I said, well, I'm going to send you a copy of this. And, and I did at least get that off to him uh, a number of years ago. And, uh, but it was just, he was such a, um, he was a quiet spoken person. You, you, you would never, I never heard him raise his voice. Um, and of course, you don't have to be loud <laughs> to be effective. Uh, and this is someone who really spoke from a, uh, I would say, a deep uh, self awareness deep, uh, deep uh, pride in his, in his history, in his people's history, and uh, communicated that just by his uh, dignity and uh, his uh, focus on, you might say, deep issues. And, mm -hmm. uh, 
And, and I really uh, was affected by that talk that he gave. And it's something that uh, I should have thought, you know, you think of things. I, uh, and I, uh, I should have tried to bring a copy of the poster that we did. And one of the main elements in this, this uh, poster on African and African-American pioneers in mathematics was the Ishango bone as a design element, sort of going back in history, like almost like railroad tracks and, and what have you. And, um, you know, he was someone who influenced, I think, the people around him by his quiet dignity. And so, you know, you, you, know, you sort of take this in and you say, well, you know, uh, I mean, he seemed to be fearless in terms of what he would confront. I mean, very, very few things uh, that he thought, uh, anything he thought was wrong, he would challenge it, mm -hmm. you know, and it didn't really matter the context, you know, that was, whether that was in the mathematical community or, and he's obviously not the only person, you know, mm -hmm. like that, but in any case, that was one thing that really, you could say about him, he didn't, wasn't one for raising his voice, mm -hmm. but he would um, try to raise your consciousness of, of the, the uh, things that had been done by people before you, um, and, and so on, and and a lot, a lot of things, you know, people are not aware of in general, whether in the math community or the public at large. And so, you know, he was just a very dynamic, quiet spokesperson for a lot of issues. Okay. Um, Dr. Knight, could you tell us what type of uh, student in the classroom or what type of practices he would have his students do so that they could be successful? A lot of things like these gatherings we used to have. He would come to the dormitory he would go in the basement of Bumstead Hall. That's when you had men and women, you didn't, didn't mix up. Well, he would come and he would sit and talk. And he would have days where we could, those of us who knew French, could learn from him. He said, now, when you get ready to take your exams for your PhD, it's going to not be like the French you had in your class. It's going to be his own mathematics. And he taught you little things that these are words over here that are going to appear. He also spoke German, and so he moved us ahead and said, take a book, and you can teach yourself a whole lot of things. So when we sat for a, a French exam or a German exam, we didn't have to worry about it, because Dr. Uh, uh, Cross had told us that it's not what you learn in your German class or your English class or your French class. It's going to only be by mathematics. And there's some fault, you know, things like that. I mean, he looked ahead to say, if you know you're going for that, you got to be ready. Mm -hmm. you got to be ready for that. And I tell you, another thing he did, he used to talk to parents oh, in high school okay. mm -hmm. of people and so forth. He would talk. And then I think one of the things that really hurt him was when he decided the inner thing tick and say, I would like to be Shabazz and change his belief. He didn't change his foundation, he just changed his belief in religion. Mm -hmm. But he said, you can't criticize anything unless you participate. He said, you can go to any church you want to, and most of us went on Auburn Avenue, because we were all Christians mm -hmm. in that time. Had a very few, like he had in the, in the end of his career, a lot of people from other country. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, we were all Southern, most of Southern people, and a few people from out in the United States. But we were Christians. He said, go to your church. And in the afternoon, you go over to the mosque and you listen. You learn a whole lot about history and about people going to the mosque to learn it. I mean, he was a fair-minded person. You know, the non-Western, I, I guess he would really be jumping up and down now about the things that happened. Look at what's going on around the world in the non-Western civilization. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I... I I just think he just did things and he knew what it was at the next level. And he said, you can prepare yourself. He would give you books. He would buy you books and so forth. And he had a code. And the code said, let's eat ice cream. So in class, he had a, a net, could read, look at your face and know you didn't understand. He could actually <laughs> read your mind. Because he said, do you understand what I just said? Oh, yeah. And you look this blank look. He said, you thinking so and so, but that's not what I'm saying. Then he would go to the board and he would do that. And his mm -hmm. code was, if all of us sat there, he would say, let's go have ice cream. 
He was on it in Boston two years ago, mm -hmm. up on the platform at the banquet. And so we were walking back to the hotel, from one hotel to another hotel. And out of the clear blue sky, he said, let's have some ice cream. And everybody said, we just had this big banquet. I know he's not hungry. I was the only person in the crowd because <laughs> I was his student. I said, oh, Lord, this is going to be late. He talked until he put us out of the place. <laughs> he had an idea something somebody had said during the day, and he wanted to clear it up. And he told me, I fell asleep two hours. Oh, okay. And on that note, I think they're getting ready to put us out of this oh, place, so we're going to have to wrap the show up. But right. it's been a pleasure. Thank you both for coming on oh, and sharing you. yes. your memories and yes. uh, inspirations about Dr. Shabazz. Uh, we'll have to have you back again to talk some more about these mathematics, Dr. Shabazz, and things like that. Uh, thank you very much, audience, for uh, listening and uh, sharing your time with us to hear Dr. Knight and Dr. Hawkins and stay tuned for future shows on Africa's Vision Network.